Uh, okay, uh, good morning everyone. Welcome to Nupi. As you see, my name is not... Uh, I'm not Karsten Fries. Uh, <laughs> he's over here. He, in the program it was uh, scheduled he would moderate this session, but I was able to re reallocate my agenda slightly so I could be here. So that's a, a great pleasure to be here this morning. Uh, as you know, NATO is turning uh, 70 years, um, and, uh, and we have a range of security issues facing uh, NATO, and we have a, a long list of topics for the transatlantic agenda. Uh, the general observation is that the security situation in our region and uh, globally is uh, becoming uh, more tense. The relationship between markets and security is changing. We also see that the relationship between technologies and security is changing. Um, and we are very fortunate today to have uh, with us Acting Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary Michael Murphy. Very long title. He told me that means basically he is responsible, he has the responsibility, but not. Uh, not the authority <laughs> for for uh, for uh, European and Eurasian affairs. So it's a great pleasure to have uh, Michael with us today. He will give a talk uh, for uh, 25 minutes or so, and then we will have a bit of a conversation here and a Q&A session. Uh, let me also remind you that this session is streamed, uh, uh, and uh, I would just give the floor to to Michael to give his remarks, and uh, it's great to have you here at NUPE, and, uh, and we look very much look forward to this. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, I want to thank you all for having me here today, and NUPE for organizing this. I, uh, I feel very tall, uh, which is nice, because I'm not a very tall individual, so I appreciate the the ability to look like I'm bigger than I actually am. Um, this year, 2019, marks the 70th anniversary of NATO's founding. It's cause for both celebration and for reflection about NATO's future. In 1949, as Europe was rebuilding from the ruins, Western countries joined together to co-found NATO. The outcomes at the time were not certain, and America could have instead packed its bags and come home. But after the devastation of two world wars and facing the prospect of further Soviet aggression, our predecessors on both sides of the Atlantic saw the risk to each other's nations and understood that only in alliance could we guarantee our security. This was a brave and a visionary choice for the political leaders of the period, requiring an investment at the time when each country faced significant competing political and economic priorities. This momentous decision laid the foundation for 70 years of unparalleled peace, prosperity, and human flourishing within the transatlantic community. Now, NATO has been called the most successful alliance in history. The moniker is, I think, deserved. Article 5 defines the bedrock commitment, and it has remained the constant for 70 years. But as threats have changed, NATO's definition of its core tasks have also changed. 1949, 1989, 2001, each of these dates presented the alliance with a new strategic environment. Each time, our governments answered the call by reshaping our defenses and developing new capabilities to resist emerging threats. For NATO's first 40 years, the strategic environment required us to maintain large conventional armies designed to deter and, if necessary, defeat the Soviet Union. During the height of the Cold War, the United States Army had some 400,000 personnel in Europe. Canada had a permanent military presence in Germany. The Bundeswehr's strength was some 495,000 military and 190,000 civilian personnel. Norway could mobilize at least 10 heavy brigades, and the Netherlands had over 700 tanks. 
Each morning, those soldiers and our leaders woke up thinking about the Fulda Gap, the likely route for a Soviet tank invasion of Western Germany. And in the high north, the site of the longest land border between the Alliance and the Soviet Union. But after 1989, with the fall of the Berlin Wall and the collapse of the Soviet Union, the scope and size of these forces seemed unnecessary and expensive. At that point, nations could have called NATO a success and closed up shop. But again, our visionary predecessors recognized that the environment had changed, but we still needed NATO, but we needed it to do different things. So we entered into a new era. For the first time, NATO built partnerships with our Cold War adversaries. We welcomed new allies who had lived under Soviet oppression for years. We addressed ethnic conflict in the Balkans. During the 1990s, our threat assessments changed, and we adjusted our force posture and capabilities accordingly. We talked about peace dividends, reduced our defense spending, and maintained smaller forces. That historical moment ended on September 11th in the morning in 2001. For the first time in Alliance history, we invoked Article 5 as we came face to face with the realities of a new century. We realized that we were confronted not only with traditional threats, but also with threats from non-state actors who could strike cheaply and anonymously from another continent. In that moment, we understood that we needed to be able to operate outside of our immediate territories. These new strategic concerns and new missions required new capabilities. In addition to the conflict stabilization and crisis management missions we developed in the 1990s, we needed forces capable of conducting counterterrorism, irregular warfare, and counterinsurgency operations. The move away from large standing armies, the changes we began to implement at the end of the Cold War, they accelerated. And the focus shifted to challenges emanating from places like Afghanistan, Iraq, Libya, and the Sahel. And as that happened, some saw Europe as a post-geopolitical, post-historical space. The experts and the pundits assured us that we had reached the end of history and seen the breaking of nations in Europe. The world was now flat, and we could focus on commerce and in harnessing the information technology revolution to the benefit of humankind. These views, in turn, justified a further period of military cuts, cuts to personnel, cuts to platforms, and cuts to investments in new systems. But as always, the world continued to turn, history rolled on, and the pendulum swung back. Today, we find ourselves in another era, the return of great power competition. Europe is once again a theater of strategic competition. Once again, Russia is engaged in efforts to tear apart what we have built over the last 70 years. It seeks to undermine NATO, the European Union, and the OSCE. It seeks to discredit and destabilize our democracies. It seeks to reestablish spheres of influence over neighboring states. And it does all this with a wide range of tools, some old and some new. One of Russia's evolving tactics is the use of malicious cyber operations. You will recall the first high-profile attack in 2007 against Estonia, ostensibly in response to Estonia's relocating a statue of a Russian soldier. But Russia was just getting started. In 2008, Russia deployed offensive cyber operations in Georgia. In 2015 and 2016, Russia attacked Ukraine's energy grid. In 2017, Russia's reckless NotPetya cyber attack spread around the world, causing billions of dollars in damage. And in 2018, Russia planned, a Russian planned cyber attack against the OPCW was thwarted by Dutch and UK security services. Here in Norway, 
your government has identified GPS jamming linked to Russian electronic interference during NATO's Trident Juncture exercise last October. I can say with some confidence that this is not the end of Russia's efforts in cyber warfare. Russia has also revived Soviet-era disinformation and malign influence strategies in an effort to divide the West, mislead our publics, and undermine our democracies. Russia's attempts to covertly influence the 2016 elections in the United States are well known, but they are hardly singular. The Kremlin has sought to influence dozens of elections by spreading disinformation on social media and seeking to funnel money to political parties. In the Western Balkans, Russia seeks to exacerbate ethnic tensions. Russia and its proxies have engaged in dangerous behavior trying to prevent Montenegro from joining NATO. And more recently, the Kremlin and its malign networks have attempted to derail the PRESPA agreement that resolved the tensions between North Macedonia and Greece and have paved the way for North Macedonia's ascension to NATO. Similarly, Russia has a long history of weaponizing its energy supplies. In 1990, the then Soviet Union disrupted oil supplies to the Baltic states in a vain effort to crush the region's nascent independence movements. Russians often targeted Ukraine, Georgia, and Lithuania during the 1990s and the 2000s. In spite of its contractual obligations, Russia has cut off gas supplies to Ukraine and through, through Ukraine to Europe four times since 2005. Sudden price increases on natural gas, su supply manipulations, sudden debt calls. Russia manipulates its position in the European energy sector to exploit vulnerabilities, to influence domestic politics in importing countries, and to intimidate its neighbors. In 2008, Russia provoked a war with Georgia and sought to carve out the regions of Abkhazia and South Ossetia to establish de facto dominion over Georgia to prevent Georgia from enjoying a future in the West and to quash its democratic aspirations. Today, 20% of Georgian territory remains occupied by Russia, and Russia is still working to undermine Georgia's progress on its democratic and other reforms. Ukraine is the clearest example of Russia's blatant disregard for international law and its threat to our shared vision of a Europe strong and free. Russia's seizure of three Ukrainian ships and 24 crew members in the Black Sea near the Kerch Strait last November was a shocking violation of Ukrainian sovereignty. But it was part of a larger pattern of Russian behavior that includes the purported annexation of Crimea, abuses against Ukrainians living there, sponsoring a conflict that has taken in more than 13,000 lives in the Donbass region of eastern Ukraine. And as all of us as NATO allies have recognized, Russia has violated the INF Treaty by deploying new ground launch based missiles with ranges forbidden by that treaty. Missiles that are aimed at and can hit Europe. Of course, Russia is not the only strategic competitor that we face. An increasingly bold China is challenging Western influence and values. China is seeking to build a strategic foothold in Europe by employing so-called gray zone tactics investments in sensitive technologies, infrastructure, and natural resources that could threaten our security. It is critical that the Allies have a secure, reliable information and transportation networks. And we are concerned about Chinese influence, and we are encouraging all of our allies to include national security, including cybersecurity, as a key criteria when they evaluate infrastructure investments. We have taken a close look at the risks before making procurement decisions on 5G, for example. China also impacts NATO security along our southern periphery, where it is expanding its presence, including a building a long-term military and naval presence in Africa. At the same time, we cannot ignore the challenges posed by nations like North Korea or Iran. And as we said at the Brussels summit last year, terrorism is a threat to our populations. This includes the threat terrorist groups, this includes threats terrorist groups intent on infiltrating our homelands to conduct mass casualty attacks and looking to inspire homegrown terrorists to do the same. Now that's a long list, of, long and sobering list of challenges. So the question becomes what do we do about it? I would argue that today our task 
is to rally and preserve the West as a land of order and liberty against these new threats. While it is fitting that we look back this year and celebrate all we have accomplished since 1949, we must also demonstrate the same courage that NATO's founders did in 1949 when they made the difficult decisions to defend the transatlantic space. To quote Winston Churchill, success is not final, failure is not fatal. It is the courage to continue that counts. And the challenges we faced in 2019 are just as complex as those we faced in 1949 or in 1989 or again after September 11, 2001. The moment has come once again to renovate the alliance and to adapt it to new strategic realities. Russia, China, terrorism, Iran. We cannot pick and choose what threats we want to meet. NATO must meet them all. One high-ranking Norwegian military leader has conceded that by themselves, Norwegian forces lack the robustness to defend against an armed attack. We can say that about any of our allies. No single country can do this job alone. We need each other. As one of America's great founding fathers said, we must all hang together, or most assuredly, we shall hang separately. This understanding is what prompted North America and Europe to join together 70 years ago to create a new Western order, firmly grounded in transatlantic cooperation. Given our record of success over the last 70 years, there is no reason to believe we cannot do so again. But we cannot be complacent. We cannot simply assume that our successful past is prologue to a successful future. And as challenges to NATO accelerate, we must accelerate our responses. We must prioritize investment in our security if we want our grandchildren to enjoy it much as our grandparents did. The reemergence of Russia as a long-term competitor is our most immediate challenge and must be a top priority. The Kremlin has unambiguously stated that it sees the transatlantic community as a threat. No amount of wishful thinking on our part can avoid recognizing the intent behind their actions. The challenges from Russia have occurred in the context of one of the most significant military modernizations in Russia's history. While NATO militaries retooled to focus on stability operations, and we replaced our heavy forces with lighter ones to meet challenges in places like Kosovo and Afghanistan, Russia retained a heavy combined arms force that emphasizes mobility and firepower. Over the last decade, Russia has modernized its weapons, improved its military readiness, and gain combat experiences in places like Georgia and Ukraine, and it has modernized its nuclear arsenal. As we know from its military exercises, Russia is training and exercising its forces to conduct large-scale operations, demonstrating its capacity to mass ready forces quickly along NATO's eastern flanks. We have to be ready to address challenges from Russia across the entire transatlantic theater. We must, defend, we must defend the Suwalki Gap, a strip of land only 100, and 100 kilometers wide that links our Baltic allies to Poland and the rest of Europe, and which has made, been made more vulnerable by Russia's anti-access area denial, or A2AD, efforts in Kaliningrad. At the same time, we must cope with growing Russian military aggression in the Black Sea, in the high north, Russia is reopening old Cold War facilities, rebuilding its military infrastructure, and deploying more modern forces. In the North Atlantic, Russia is increasing its submarine patrols and operating at a rate not seen since the end of the Cold War. We, too, need heavier, high-end forces to meet these challenges. In other words, we, too, must retool our militaries just as we have retooled them to deal with the threats in the 1990s when a shift from heavy to light forces was required. We must now scale up our forces and improve their readiness and their mobility. We need more systems like next generation fighters, heavier infantry and armor brigades, improved intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance assets, 
and a greater focus on integrated air and missile defense. This is not going to be easy, and it's not going to be inexpensive, and it's not going to be fast. But we need to stay focused, because we're already behind the curve. Allies must also invest in new technologies and more innovative approaches to defend against cyber attacks. And we need to be able and willing to shed light on hybrid tactics and expose their true, na true nature, particularly their source, like the Dutch did when the Russians attacked the OPCW. We cannot allow disinformation and malign influence, two of the main tools of hybrid warfare, to drive us apart or divert us from meeting the challenges that we face. All of this, heavier and more ready forces, greater cyber capabilities, and a focus on hybrid threats is necessary if we are to present a credible deterrence and defense posture suited to the current strategic environment. And we must do all this while deepening our partnerships with countries in the Middle East and North Africa, strengthening NATO's efforts against challenges coming from the South, contributing to international crisis management efforts, and helping our partners in those regions build their resilience against th security threats, especially terrorism. The stronger those countries are, the safer we are. If each ally does its part, the alliance will have the capabilities it needs to protect our citizens and to protect the West. It's that simple. The, decisions is, the decision is ours to make. We must make national priorities of the investments that are necessary to retool our militaries. The United States is doing just that. In 2019, the United States will spend $16 billion more on, the def on defense than we did in 2018, spending a total of 3.5% of our GDP on defense. Investment in Europe and NATO are at the core of our defense budget. We have invested over $10 billion in the last five years through the European Deterrence Initiative to enhance U.S. force posture in Europe, to enhance U.S. force posture in Europe, increase our training and exercises in Europe, and upgrade U.S. and allied facilities and preposition military stocks in Europe. The alliance, as our soldiers say, is a force multiplier. We can do things together that none of us, not even the strongest allies, can do alone. We need each other and we need to count on each other. Together we have secured one of the longest periods of peace and stability the world has ever seen. Our values, our societies, our laws, our freedoms, and our economies, our very citizens' lives have benefited enormously from the cooperation forged in NATO. But we have reached an inflection point in history, and we need more vision and more attention to the threats around us. The alternative is to sit back and allow the world's most successful alliance to become obsolete and leave our grandchildren to fend for, our, fend for themselves. If we do not take seriously the commitments we have made to one another and to our collective defense, that's where we're going. We cannot be passive. We must invest more in defense, in ourselves, in each other, and in our future. And that brings me to the numbers 2 and 20. 2% of GDP on defense, and 20% of those defense expenditures spent on major new equipment. Now, this is not a new concept. Allies began using these numbers as benchmarks as early as 2006. In September 2014, just months after the Russia invasion of Ukraine, these numbers were formally approved by our heads of state and government as commitments we made to one another. This was the so-called Defense Investment Pledge, approved at the 2014 NATO Summit in Wales. When we made the Wales Pledge, we were just beginning to grasp the implication of Russia's military modernization and the challenges to our security. Everything we have seen in the threat environment since our meeting in Wales confirms that our pledge to spend more on defense was timely and necessary. The the threats to the alliance have only grown more acute since then. The Wales Pledge was an acknowledgement that we needed to do more to keep our people safe. And it was a political commitment we made to one another, a way of holding ourselves accountable to one another. Two and 20 serve as benchmarks that help us explain to our citizens 
that we need to make hard choices if the alliance is to fulfill its three core tasks of collective defense, crisis management, and cooperative security. But at their heart, what those investments are buying are the readiness levels, end strengths, and capabilities that we need to meet the challenges in today's security environment. This is not merely a question for consideration with the within the ministries of defense and foreign affairs. This must be a truly national commitment by parliaments and people. Everyone in our countries must understand the importance of defending ourselves and our way of life. We must do the important work of explaining to our fellow citizens how these investments will contribute to their security, their prosperity, and their freedom. As Secretary Stoltenberg, Secretary General Stoltenberg, said in his address to a joint session of the U.S. Congress in April, and I quote, our alliance has not lasted for 70 years out of a sense of nostalgia or sentiment. NATO lasts because it is in the national interests of each and every one of our nations. In April, my country hosted the NATO foreign ministers to celebrate the alliance's 70th anniversary. Our ministers released a statement that celebrated all the alliance had accomplished over the last 70 years. That statement presented a realistic picture of the security environment and affirm today's security environment and affirmed NATO's commitment to the decisions made at the 2018 Brussels summit. Now, at the end of the year, NATO heads of state and government will meet in London to provide further strategic direction for the years ahead. We need to capitalize on these meetings to strengthen our resolve and our dedication to ensuring that NATO has what it needs to meet today's security challenges. History has given us an opportunity. It has allowed us a glimpse of the new threats before us. They are not surprises. We have seen these threats evolving over the past decade. We have the time and the opportunity now to address them but that window will not stay open forever. NATO is strong and has some incredibly powerful tools to meet these threats. So we, is, so we must not put, put all that we have achieved at risk because we cannot or will not make the case to our people of the need to invest the resources required to secure the alliance for the next generation. What will we tell our children if NATO fails at its task of defending our nations? or if they ask us why we did nothing, despite all the evidence before us, to respond to the challenges that we face. The moment is ours, and we must choose. And it is time to honor the commitments we have made to one another for the past 70 years, to ensure our shared space, our, our shared peace, stability, and prosperity for the future. Thank you. Okay, please. Um, okay. Thank you so much uh, for your remarks. Um, I think a uh, very clear message somehow. <laughs> uh, first, uh, uh, about the urgency uh, of, of doing something, so the kind of assessment of the security situation. And then secondly, about, and that's uh, maybe comforting for many, uh, basically stressing the U.S. commitment to, to the alliance and... Um, and also, as I understand, a uh, preference for doing, meeting these challenges jointly together, rather than through a strategy of bilateralization, for instance. And uh, thirdly, a call for action. Um, so, uh, so that's a clear message somehow. Uh, now, uh, let me just start with one uh, point, and then we can open up for a di discussion. But, and that relates to burden sharing. Uh, uh, so now you're in Norway, uh, so we meet one of those uh, uh, wage targets, uh, the 20%, so invest uh, quite heavily in new gear. Uh, at the same time, we don't meet the other target, the 2%. Uh, and in fact, we're not even moving. We have increased our spending, but we have not actually, n n this year, or, uh, we are not moving closer to the 2% target either. We are actually moving slightly away from it. So, um, uh, so it's I think it's around 1.6 percent. 1.61, I think, or something right. like that. And it might end up with 1.59 or something next year, I think. 
so, uh, so, so, what kind of advice would you give uh, Norway, or what, what would you like to see uh, Norwegian politicians do, and what kind of advice or remark would you give to Norwegian voters, ultimately, because they have to make a choice between security and welfare, uh, and uh, what's the link between this security and welfare? You alluded to some of these things. I think the first thing I'd say is that we need to remember that the decisions that we're taking as an alliance are decisions we've taken together, and that includes uh, decisions about what investment, what our investment pledge target should look like. But beyond that, beyond the, the setting of the formal investment pledge in 2014, the alliance meets regularly, uh, and every year it sets capability targets based on the threat environment that we face. Um, and I think the exp and those are, those are set jointly, you know, within the alliance and in conversation with individual member states, Norway, the United States, Britain, Germany, we all go through this process. And I think the most important message I can give uh, well, not just to Norway, but to any member of the alliance, is we need to hit our NATO capability targets. So if the NATO capability targets call for a particular size force, a particular type of capability, uh, and I, I don't want to get into the specifics here, then my, my advice would be that we ought to meet those and that we ought to make the investments that are required to meet them uh, as, as quickly and as soon as possible because the assumption behind all of them is that should there be a crisis, these forces will be available to us collectively and to the Strategic Allied Command to be able to mitigate and limit the impact of any crisis. And if we don't have the capabilities required to meet the challenges that we face, then we won't be able to handle the challenge. We won't be able to handle the challenges that we face. So that's the first piece of advice I'd give. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh. So uh, you, you mentioned several things uh, uh, in your speech about uh, uh, Mediterranean, Northern Africa, and you said a few things about the Arctic as well. So, but uh, maybe you could say a few words about how the U.S. see Arctic and the sure. sea or kind of this part of Europe as the strategic importance of it and and increased attention to it and uh, the role of NATO somehow in, in the Arctic. Well, let me, let, me say, let me say a few things about the Arctic. The first thing I would point out is we see the Arctic Council as the primary governing forum for the Arctic. There are no near Arctic states. There are Arctic states and non-Arctic states. So that's number one. And we also see the Arctic Council as a particularly effective uh, multilateral institution. Um, its focus is on things like environmental protection, scientific research and cooperation, indigenous development, and we think all of that's been positive and can and should continue. It's an area where uh, the United States and the other Arctic states, including Russia, work quite well together. That having been said, as the Secretary of State pointed out uh, in Finland a few weeks ago, there are emerging security challenges in the Arctic as well that we all need to be uh, cognizant of and be prepared to respond to. Um, and, you know, those include some, of, some, some elements of Russian behavior, uh, but also increasing encroachment uh, by the Chinese. And I think what the Secretary was attempting to do was to point out that these security challenges are there and that we need to respond to them. And the United States is looking at a whole-of-government response to this. Uh, you know, the Secretary represents the State Department, uh, but we have other agencies, whether it's the, you know, the National Science Foundation or the Department of Homeland Security, that are also trying to look at the Arctic the Department of Energy and how involved we have been and how engaged we've been and try to enhance that engagement because we need to pay more attention to this region of the world for some of the reasons I just identified. Um, you know, uh, it's, it's an important part of uh, why the, the second fleet was reactivated. You know, we have to be able to move across the North Atlantic in the event of a crisis. Uh, the Arctic is part of that challenge. Um, but we're not looking uh, and haven't, and the Secretary did not argue, in fact, he said the exact opposite, that those other areas of cooperation should discontinue or shouldn't continue. We believe strongly that they, they ought to continue. And where we're working to well together, including with the Russians, we're, that's terrific. Um, uh, but it's not an either or, it's the need to do both that I think is something we all have to realize. Deal with the security challenges we face and continue the good work we've done in other areas. So, yeah, and that brings me to kind of my final remark before we open up. And, and that, so you're in the State Department, and the typically the State Department will also be involved in some kind of diplomacy. So what you've done now is basically to advocate 
kind of acting in terms of promoting diplomacy between kind of Western countries or, or transatlantic countries. So, but what kind of role do you see for diplomacy in trying to reduce some of the tensions that you, that you kind of very clearly, or frictions or security threats that you see? Do you, do you, is there, is it somehow worthwhile to engage in diplomacy uh, in order to try to reduce some of these tensions, or is this not the time for diplomacy at that time? Well, I, you won't be surprised as a diplomat that I think diplomacy is a wonderful tool uh, <laughs> in, in statecraft and in foreign policy and security policy. Um, of course, uh, we should continue to engage in diplomacy, and we do. I mean, uh, you know, the Secretary of State was in, in Russia recently having conversations with the Russians about those areas where we feel it's possible uh, to work together. Um, we've had some uh, talks about counterterrorism, for example. Um, uh, we're, we've had talks about strategic stability, for example. But that's different from having a conversation about Ukraine where we concede what Russia's done uh, and say, okay, diplomacy doesn't mean uh, accepting fait accomplis or outcomes that challenge uh, American and European security. So the, the key is finding the right balance. Um, you know, uh, we engaged in five years of diplomacy with the Russians on the INF Treaty, uh, and it didn't yield any change in Russian behavior. In fact, during that period, the Russians continued with their programs, if not accelerating their programs. So uh, it's not the only, it's, it's a wonderful tool. Um, we shouldn't, you know, hold out hope that it's always going to work in every circumstance. Uh, we pursue it where we can, uh, but we also have to be hard headed and um, clear-eyed about the challenges that we face, because part of what we're talking about is deterring uh, the types of threats uh, that we're facing now. And that's a concept that, you know, we haven't had to think about for many, many years, and we need to, we need to relearn uh, or re-exercise some of that muscle memory that we all have from uh, the period when geopolitics did indeed, uh, you know, drive world, world uh, uh, international affairs. Okay, let's open up for uh, Q&A, and then Please identify yourself. Over here first. Okay. Okay. My name is Manila Rika. I'm a research professor here at NUPI, working on European uh, European affairs, European integration. And one of my questions is: you, t you talked about burden sharing, and of course, the two percent goal, the twenty percent uh, investment uh, kind of ambition and and of course this is this is important but it didn't mention the initiatives taken uh, in the EU uh, moving towards uh, European defense integration the European defense fund pesco and so on and these uh, I just wonder how you how you see this as a tool for uh, improving uh, the European defense capacity uh, of course not uh, as a as a uh, as it, it, it will be in addition to the two percent goal and, and the the ambitions uh, or, or the commitments in NATO, but um, but I was a bit surprised that I didn't mention that at all. Well, let me. I'd be ha more than happy to to uh, to mention it now. Um, let me start by going back to first principles. I mean, the defense impl investment pledge within the alliance, um, uh, which we set uh, amongst ourselves uh, in 2014 and the NATO capability targets that we, we set on a regular basis based on the threat environment we face, those stand alone. Uh, there's no reason uh, why we should require any outside actor to meet those targets ourselves. Those are the responsibilities of each individual ally and all of us to Article 3 and Article 5 of the North Atlantic Treaty. So. Norway or Belgium or America or Canada or Britain or Germany or any country should be looking to meet those uh, capability targets and meeting the Defense Investment Pledge quite independent of anything else acting outside of the alliance. Having said that, um, you know, the United States has uh, endorsed, as have other NATO states and EU member states, both the 2016 and the 2018 NATO-EU joint declarations, which make clear that we believe the EU defense initiatives, including PESCO and EDF, have the potential to contribute positively to security in the European and transatlantic space. So we, that's a fundamental, uh, there's fundamental agreement on that. Now there's a couple other uh, parts of those declarations that I want to reference because I think they're just as important. Uh, they're built around a couple of assumptions. One is that these initiatives are not duplicative or competitive with the alliance. 
And the second is that they are as open to third state participation as is possible in that context. So the principle of these initiatives, we're no objection from the United States. And that's a fundamental change in the U.S. view on NATO EU and EU defense initiatives. And it's an important one, because when I joined the department many years ago and worked these issues, that is not the approach the United States would have taken. In fact, NATO and EU, they, they wouldn't even talk to one another uh, 25 years ago. They do now because they recognize they need to, and that's the right thing to be doing. But the devil is in the details of the implementation. So what we're concerned about now is that the implementation of EDF and PESCO in the form of the legislation in EDF and the regulations crafted in PESCO are designed to essentially prohibit or in effect to deny de facto participation by non-EU NATO allies in some of these in some of these programs and if that's the case uh, over a period of time we risk uh, pulling apart one of the great successes of the last 15 or 20 years, which is the integration of the transatlantic uh, defense industrial sector. U European companies play an important role in the United States. Uh, you know, the, the, I like to cite the fact that the M4 rifle was produced in Sweden, and that's a rifle that our uh, services use in the United States. Um, and, of course, uh, we work jointly on things like the Joint Strike Fighter. Uh, so we don't want to see a uh, pulling apart of, of that integration uh, and that effort to work together in these areas because it will inevitably lead to duplication and resources pushed in, in areas that are at odds with what our prime priorities are, are right now. They'll compete for one another. So that's the challenge. And, and we've, uh, we've raised those concerns with uh, the EU and with EU member states. Uh, I think there are many EU member states that understand our views and I think are sympathetic to them and of course there are those who, who may not be. Um, and we're committed to continuing to, co to talk with uh, the union and the member states to try to ensure that we get these foundational rules right. Because if you don't get the rules right, they're going to skew outcomes, uh, you know, five, ten years from now. So that's really important to us. So this, the, the bullet point here answer is we support them, and we've indicated we've prepared to support them and that they can contribute. But that depends upon how they're implemented and how the rules of the game are set up. And right now, we're concerned about the second. Okay, uh, we have uh, uh, at least two people joining us. So the first, uh, first of all, please introduce yourself. Um, thank you. Yes, indeed, a message, a very clear message. Introduce yourself, please. Yes, uh, Rolf Oberg uh, from the... Uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, pensioner. Uh, I think we all uh, can do a very good job listening to messages like you about the message of NATO, what it has done. Uh, and and uh, I think we all deserve to, to, to hear that. I would have a, 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 a comment though. And that is, uh, I did my part of the Cold War in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the, the ups and downs. And we were all tremendously taken up with the relationship between Soviet Union and 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 uh, and, and and the USA and 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 the uh, you mentioned the Fulda gap. I can really imagine, perhaps remember what we did in the afternoon. Even in Norway, we went out to the Fulda gap to listen to the rumble of Soviet tanks going through uh, the Fulda gap, uh, aiming at the. Uh, Western uh, Western positions. One thing which I still lack, uh, miss a little bit from uh, the, the good old times, that was even if the competition and the ideological rivalry between the West and 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 uh, um, and the Soviet Union was very tough, still as a parallel to the military build build up, there was a row of security policy negotiations, particularly in the, in the uh, disarmament and arms control field. And I, 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 I have an impression that perhaps we are lacking uh, a little bit of that. Of course, I know you have tried to make a uh, headway with the Russians, let's say, on the, uh, uh, on, 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 the, uh, on the Ukraine thing. And the Russians really haven't been too forthcoming, but still, if you go back to the core lessons of arms control, I think arms control will succeed when you negotiate from strength and when you can negotiate in an area where both parties 
do have a certain common interest, not to solve all the questions, but solve some outstanding questions. If you go back to the present agenda, particularly between uh, the United States and, 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 and Russia, uh, and it is a little bit of an unfair question, but where, which areas could you possibly single out uh, where the two parties might find a common interest in negotiating, talking about things which matter to them directly and their security interest? Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Please uh, keep the, your remarks uh, a bit shorter next time. <laughs> well, I, I just I'll, I can I can repeat some of what I've said. You know, we do have conversations with the Russians where it's where it's possible to have conversations with the Russians and where it's in our our shared interests. Uh, we tried hard uh, for five years on on the INF agreement. Uh, we're working with NATO allies on you know some uh, efforts to improve the Vienna document to improve transparency and confidence building on the conventional arms front. I don't know if the Russians are going to be prepared to engage constructively in that conversation. Perhaps not. Uh, but we are pursuing it. Um, we've had talks, uh, we were, you know, again, the Secretary was there t looking at areas where we can collaborate and talk with one another on areas like, uh, you know, uh, I mentioned um, uh, counterterrorism, for example. Um, we have a special envoy who's sought to engage constructively with the Russians on Ukraine. Um, you know, the Russians haven't engaged constructively with us, or for that matter, with Germany or France or any of the European states. So. Um, you know, we're not averse to doing that, uh, and we do do it, uh, and we do try, um, but uh, we also have to deal with the reality of the world in which we live, and, you know, Russia now has been quite aggressive in pursuing its uh, security and other agendas and interests across the European continent, and we have to be prepared to deal with that. We can't expect, uh, you know, one more round of conversations to end it all, because we've tried. Okay, thank you. And then, uh, we're here. Thank you. I'm Karsten Fritz, working at NUPI. Um, and thank you very much for, for a very broad and good, good kind of overview of the, of the, of the in your talk. Um, let me first, if I may first comment uh, quickly on, the, on my colleague's uh, question and your response to that. Uh, as an academic, of course, you're always frustrated with the 2% target because it all measures input and not output. And, and you very correctly said, let, let's focus on the, on, the, on, the, on the outputs, right? On the, on the, on the capability targets and all stuff. Still, it is a frustration that <laughs> Europe spends much more money on defense than, than Russia does. But what we take a bird's view, we don't get much effect out of it because we all want to have national control over our military forces. So it's lots of duplication and potential for increased European cooperation is huge, I would say. I mean, we could, we could, you know, we can hardly bring up a division, but maybe we should in principle. But my question um, is more on the, on the, you know, the, well, the glue that keeps us together in NATO, the solidarity, is actually our values that we actually share some, you know, democratic principles. And how, uh, my question is, how concerned are you about? Uh, I mean, there are some tensions within Europe in particular, but also across them, the whole Atlantic uh, alliance about, you know, values being a bit more polarized political landscape. And of course, if that continues too much, it's going to be difficult to, mo to, to mobilize on a, in a shared platform, a shared position of what's happening, uh, share you know, threat perceptions and, and a response in case something happens. So could you, could you say a few words about that? I, mean, I think this takes two forms. Um, you know, one is you know, policy disagreements that, that exist between the United States and some European countries. Because European countries, we should be careful not to talk about European countries all having a singular view, because of course they don't. Um, and, you know, we've had differences in the past uh, between the United States and Europe uh, going all the way back to the alliance's founding. Um, and, you know, I think the core set of values and the core set of strategic interests have kept us together through that period, even when we were arguing about, say, Vietnam or the dual track approach uh, or even the Iraq war. So I, I don't view the, I, the, the notion that we have policy differences in areas uh, as necessarily debilitating. Uh, and I think the Secretary General was right. We, we all have a, an understanding of sort of the core set of security interests that have brought us together and kept us together for the last 70 years. And those are, those, those are still fundamental. Having said that, I do recognize that we all have different domestic political environments than we had 70 years ago or 20 years ago. Um, I do think that, that there is, uh, and I, this is a personal view, um, you know, I, I grew up in the 80s and went to school 
uh, when Ronald Reagan was president, and my worldview and my understanding of the world was shaped by that period. Uh, for folks on both sides of the Atlantic who've come of age it's since the end of the Cold War, they have a very different view uh, and a different, different formative experiences. And, and there has been a tendency, I think, uh, on both sides of the Atlantic uh, to maybe take these transatlantic connections and the transatlantic routes a little bit for granted. Uh, well, there isn't necessarily the appreciation in Europe that there once was for America or vice versa. And that's not a criticism of anybody. That's, you know, generational change occurs. So I think it's in all of our interest in reinvesting in that and reminding ourselves why we matter to one another. Um, and that, that is a challenge we have to work on every day by having conversations like this and by talking about uh, uh, what it is that's important to us as as transatlantic states. <clears throat> uh, my name is Lou Cotney. I'm an American over here for my young Norwegian American children. Um, I am a veteran. I'm also an historian, and I just like to point out that tomorrow is the 75th anniversary of D-Day, and on YouTube, the National Archives has restored a documentary titled "The True Glory." introduced by General Eisenhower, emphasizing the importance of alliance and unity. And also at the end, the World War II generation's desire that there never be another world war. Um, I had four questions, but Karsten uh, approved one. <laughs> <coughs> and uh, it's this. World War I was started by entangling alliances. If Europe creates its own army and starts a war with Russia, for example, Will our membership in NATO drag us into that war, or should European army member states be expelled from NATO to avoid that danger? Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you what I learned in diplomat school. Never answer a hypothetical. Uh, I don't, I'm not going to answer a hypothetical. I, I'm, not, uh, I'm not concerned about the EU starting a war with Russia. Okay, but, but uh, uh, there's some more questions. But let me bring up a topic that you, you just hinted to in the conversation, but that is dominating the media and basically uh, the tension in Washington. Uh, and that's the relationship between the U.S. and China. Uh, you, you, you mentioned, partly I think, as I understood you, that, that successful NATO is about adaptiveness. And, uh, and uh, on the list of kind of, uh, let's say, risk factors for the next 10, 15, 20 years, I think China is really high for, for, uh, for the US, certainly, and also probably for, for Europe. Um, so the question then is how Europe and the US should, and to the extent they do, kind of coordinate their policies towards China. How, how do you see this? And, and, uh, and that also brings us to the issue of technology, investment relationship between open markets, uh, liberal economies, and security. Maybe could you reflect if, uh, something on this and, and uh, give your views? As we all know, Ch uh, China is basically have almost stopped investing in the U.S., right? Very little foreign direct investment in the U.S. from China now. But they have increased, uh, but of, uh, during the last three or four years, quite radically in Europe. Although they have dropped a bit in the 2018 and 2019. So, but uh, so and also Europe is changing its policy, I would say, towards China, but slightly different in a s in the same direction, but the, with the slight different uh, connotations than the U.S. So, but maybe you could say a few words about. China in the transatlantic cooperation. Well, you know, I think there's there's uh, a sh uh, an unspoken consensus that China is a rising power and a growing challenge for the United States and in Europe, and we've made it explicit in our national security strategy. And the European Union is increasingly making it explicit in the way it talks about China. I think that they, they call it the systemic rival when it comes to models of governance. But uh, systemic uh, rival, great power competition. I mean, they mean this. They mean the same thing. Right. Uh, there's just 28 nego 28 countries are negotiating the language versus one getting to write it. I suspect in, in terms of how it all comes out. Um, but I do think you know NATO is beginning its conversation about uh, about China. It's taking a look at you know its strategic infrastructure and asking itself how do we protect it 
uh, how do we ensure that it's reliable in a crisis? I mean, the last thing we would want uh, is to have communications compromised. Uh, if China controlled telecommunication networks across Europe or the United States in a crisis. You wouldn't want your ability to move forces into or across Europe compromised by Chinese strategic investments. And there's no doubt that China has behaved this way uh, in the world. Um, it's there for everyone to see. Uh, we all made a bet, and it was, uh, you know, maybe that's a too flippant way to characterize it, but we made a bet in the late 90s and early part of the um, the 21st century, that bringing China into these global trading systems would uh, mitigate some of its worst behaviors and produce, uh, you know, an outcome where there was a greater respect for and adherence to the rules of the game. And we haven't seen that. Um, that doesn't mean that, uh, you know, people acted in bad faith when they made those decisions. Uh, it's just a fact that you've seen, you know, dumping and uh, technology theft and IPR theft and, you know, state subsidies and all kinds of things that are inconsistent with the obligations that the Chinese took up in the world trading system. We have to acknowledge that reality and respond to it. Uh, we can't wish it away. We can't pretend it doesn't exist. Uh, there's a role there for NATO-EU cooperation as well. We, you know, this is not a, China is not a challenge. This kind of strategic investment challenge isn't a NATO challenge. It isn't an EU challenge. It's a challenge for both institutions, and it's a challenge for the transatlantic space. That's not to say, you know, investment or trade with China is bad per se. That's not at all what the United States is saying. You know, uh, you know investment that follows the rules, uh, trade in goods and services uh, that are consistent with WTO and other international obligations is perfectly fine. Um, but if you take a look at what China is doing with technology in its own country, uh, you know, you need to be concerned about what it might be doing with technology in Europe and the United States. So I think it's smart for us to begin to pay attention to that. Um, I also think, you know, it's a big challenge. It's not an easy challenge. We can't try to bite it off every uh, problem in one go. I think the, you know, focusing on uh, strategic infrastructure and telecommunications at the beginning of this process is the right thing to do beginning to exercise the kind of muscle memory we used to have about looking at foreign investments and asking ourselves, are they problematic? Uh, you know, which is a question uh, that we used to be able to ask ourselves, you know, when, when we did think in geopolitical and geoeconomic terms, but we sort of stopped asking ourselves when we concluded that the world became flat. Um, and I think we have to move away from that, those, those post-Cold War paradigms because they're not applicable anymore. Uh, I actually feel that here the U.S.-European dialogue has been good. Uh, we've made, I think, a lot of progress in talking with one another and explaining our perspectives. And I see the European countries, the Union and individual member states in and out of the Union ha asking themselves the same sets of questions and coming to a lot of the same sets of conclusions that the United States is about the need to, uh, you know, screen foreign investments and be careful about, uh, you know, you know, turning over strategic infrastructure to Chinese companies. I think that's, it's just smart geopolitics. And it's the world we live in. I mean, I think, you know, it goes back to what I said in my speech. We have to make policies uh, designed to deal with the world as it is today. Um, uh, we can have a strategic set of objectives in mind about, you know, meeting the challenges posed by great powers and reinforcing the good that is in uh, the international order today. But we can't make policies based on a world that doesn't exist or will fail. Uh, yeah. But uh, I fully agree, and uh, you're probably aware that the Norwegian, new Norwegian security law also for the first time now have uh, kind of wordings on ownership. Um, and uh, and uh, the EU has created this framework also for regulating foreign direct investments. Um, it's probably entering into the EA agreement as well. So, so these things are happening in Europe as well, but at the same time, it's it's not an easy exercise, no. kind of how to avoid somehow ending in the trap of protectionism, uh, and uh, or at the same time ending in trap of not taking care of reasonable security concerns properly, right? So, and and uh, and China is is very much integrated into the world economic system and the value chains, etc. It's a really complex ex exercise. So it's easier to, to talk in these ways than to actually make those decisions. Well, you know, I, I, think that, I think that's right, but I also think we need to be careful not to uh, forget uh, what we've done in the past. I don't think our, 
our forefathers, if I can put it that way, looking out at the world in 1945 or 1946 saw an easy set of problems to address, or at the end of the Cold War saw an easy set of problems to address. Uh, and this period is no different. The problems are hard, but collectively, uh, with the application of a lot of elbow grease and wisdom, the United States and Europe were able to address those challenges. Um, we read the history, you know, you read a book on the Marshall Plan and it all looks inevitable, uh, right? Like it was, it was destined to be, but it wasn't. Um, you know, as I said in my speech, there were a lot of Americans who wanted to come home at the end of World War II. Uh, but there was a lot of vision and leadership there, and there was a lot of vision and leadership in Conrad Adenauer at the time and in, in you know, and other European leaders. And I think there was the same at the end of the Cold War. Uh, I think one of the great successes at the end of the Cold War was, was the integration of Eastern European countries into the European space, uh, you know, free and prosperous and strong. Uh, and we have a challenge now, too. And you, for all the reasons you've identified, it's hard. Um, but I think that just is a call to, you know, you know be more creative, be more um, uh, collaborative in trying to address it. Um, and it will look to us, I think, as we live through these periods, uh, as something that happens in fits and starts and, you know, two steps forward, one step back, as is often the case uh, when shaping and implementing foreign policy and security policy. But I like to think because of, uh, you know, the strengths that exist and the bonds that exist between Norway and the United States and Norway and Europe and Europe and the United States, that someday we're going to write the history of this period and while they're talking about a new set of problems, they're going to say, God, why, why, why wasn't it as easy as it was in 2019? It's so much harder now. Uh, I think we'll get through it. Okay, uh, Patrick. Yeah, I was actually going to, sorry, uh, Patrick Cohen. I'm a senior researcher here at, uh, at NUPI. Um, I was going to ask a, a question related to it. I'll just ask you about the, the competition or the growing uh, explicit competition, I think, between the United States uh, and, and China. Um, you've addressed a lot of those points that I wanted to, to ask you about. I might uh, simply ask, uh, as uh, the United States starts to ramp up this competition uh, in the economic space, we're looking at uh, this, the, the tariffs, uh, tit -for -tat tariffs, a potential long-term trade war, in this type of context, uh, do you think that the Trump administration has a plan uh, for this in terms of where do tariff increases in Mexico, for example, fit into this larger uh, economic competition in, in, in a in geostrategic sense? And, and the, the underlying question there is, uh, can the U.S. do this competition against China? And we're not using this language yet, but we're, we're getting close to that uh, by itself. Uh, does it need its allies, and is it wise for the U.S. to uh, increasingly try to, let's say, squeeze out uh, marginal economic utility uh, against or vis-a-vis -vis its other allies uh, when we've got a, a looming uh, global uh, competitor, uh, which is uh, a big one? Thanks. Well, I, I, that's a lot. Of, that's a huge question. Um, I, I think you'd have to write another speech to address it all. But I don't. Um, I don't think the United States is is trying to take on challenges or or uh, work in the international world without its allies. We work closely with our allies every day in Afghanistan, Iraq, and Syria, uh, where we, we consult and and talk regularly, even about areas where we disagree, like Iran. We have there's actually a lot of fundamental agreement on Iran policy between the United States and Europe. There's one big challenge in front of the two of us, but there's lots of agreement there. We work very closely with our our partners in the Middle East on these questions. Uh, we just negotiated a new uh, updated uh, Canada-Mexico Canada trade agreement. Um, you know, I th we're working with the EU and NATO on China challenges. So I, I don't, and with our South Korean and Japanese allies and our Australian allies on these questions. So I think uh, we need to separate out uh, what's in the headlines and what it is we're actually all doing on a day-to-day basis, where there's a lot of collaborative and cooperative work on meeting these challenges. So that's one. Two, I think, you know, one of the challenges of the modern era, and I'm not an expert on this, so I won't venture too far into it, is, you know, modernizing our trade rules. I mean, we set trade rules between the United States and Europe that have essentially remained somewhat similar, you know, years and years ago when our markets were opened unreciprocally, in part because we wanted to facilitate the rebuilding and the restoring of European prosperity. 
because it was in Europe's interest and in the United States' interest. We live in a different, uh, different era where, you know, part of, I, don't, I hesitate to almost say this, part of burden sharing is making sure we have a more level playing field in the trade area as well because the United States is in the position to be able to invest in the disproportionate levels that it was at the end of World War II because it was the only nation standing able to do so. So I think we do need to address those challenges. Uh, I think they're important. Um, I don't think it's unreasonable for the United States to want to have uh, access to the European market for its agricultural products, for example. So I think it's you know good that we're having these conversations. I think avoiding these difficult conversations doesn't help us any at all. I think we're better off having them and working to resolve them than pretending these challenges don't exist. My name is uh, Shel Stamnes. I'm uh, a private independent here. Turkey has decided to buy material equipment, uh, military equipment from Russia, which I understand is within their formal authority to do. But what, what consequences? Uh, do you see for NATO and also NATO versus Turkey in this situation and how can this be coped with? Well, the United States has been quite clear with Turkey. Uh, you're referring to the decision uh, to, to purchase the S-400 system. Uh, that the S-400 system and the F-35 cannot coexist in Turkey. We've been quite clear about that. Uh, we've been clear that we're willing to have a conversation uh, with Turkey about the problems we see and uh, try to reach a mutually agreeable outcome to it. But if they go forward with the S-400 purchase, there are going to be consequences. U.S. law requires it. Congress has made quite clear, uh, both in the context of our uh, legislation designed to sanction Russian arms transfers, but also more generally in the context of the security concerns that relate to the F-35 and the S-400 operating in in that shared space, that it will act. Uh, so we've explained this to Turkey. Um, you know, I don't think we've, they've crossed the Rubicon yet, um, but there will be, there will be consequences. Um, and I'm not under any illusions that they will be easy to navigate. They will become a political and diplomatic challenge for both countries. Um, but if that's the course the Turks choose to go down, then that's where we're going to wind up. So leadership is uh, leadership is very much about kind of trying to demonstrate the way forward and try to encourage others to follow you and to sometimes whip people a bit. Um, uh, but you use a carrot and a stick to kind of encourage some some others to move in the same direction somehow. Uh, and and I think that the U.S. Has always, of course, been important exercising its leadership in a transatlantic relationship, and and I see that some people in the audience here, some of their leading journalists in in uh, the no covering foreign security policy in Norway, they are here. And they were also sitting in at the München conference, uh, Munich conference, and and, and watching uh, uh, vi uh, uh, Vice President uh, Pence giving his speech, uh, and uh, basically what he said is. Basically, said there's a real long list of frictions in the transatlantic relationship. He said that we, that the U.S. or his administration, had real difficulties with one of the joint uh, the, this uh, Iran financial uh, vehicle, the 5G, the burden sharing, um, lack of burden sharing, uh, Nord Stream 2 on energy. Uh, and then uh, he didn't talk much about it, but it was also in the room somehow. All Germans were concerned about future tariffs on cars, etc. So, so it's a really long list. And add to that that uh, s the president of the U.S. sometimes and some of his advisors have really expressed concerns about the EU and going to make let's make Brexit success and uh, basically supporting also some of the forces who try to unravel the European Union. Uh, so uh, so kind of when I think that a lot of Europeans sitting in, in that room uh, basically had this sentiment, oh, hey, the US is asking for so many things at the same time and 
we will not be able to meet on all of these things uh, in a short period of time. We will enter into a period of real frictions. Uh, so, uh, but you come across as fairly optimistic. Uh, say, okay, these things can be managed, uh, and we are getting along, etc. And we are in the wrong, uh, right direction, and there's a solid value base around it. We've done it before. We can go along. So, so of course, we should. Do, so, <laughs> who should we trust somehow? <laughs> or, or, uh, of course, uh, uh, right, uh, uh, right. But, but do you, do you see, is there a risk here? And uh, where would you say, okay, what are the most important of these issues? Uh, wh and how, and I think one of the key issues that arises is how should Europe and the US manage areas where we are not in complete agreement? Well, let, let, let me, I don't know, maybe my, maybe my optimism is this place, but let me explain it. I, I mean, I grew up in the era before. Uh, social media and the internet. You know, I read books and long-form essays, and that's how you communicate it with one another. And I think there's a tendency in today's day and age uh, to be captured by the ephemera. Uh, and I, you know, the news cycle used to be 24 hours. Now, sometimes I think it's 24 seconds. Um, so I think it's really easy to get distracted uh, by things that are, at best, tactical. Certainly not strategic and to forget to see the big picture and to look at the underlying uh, trends and work that's being done on a lot of the things you just described. Um, and look, I, I get up every morning and my inbox is dominated by a lot of this too. Uh, and, it's, and, it's, and it can be frustrating, but when I take a look at what we're doing, uh, I'm reassured. Uh, you know, let me, give, let me take some of the examples uh, that you've mentioned. On burden sharing, we have work to do. I mean, that's what my whole presentation was about this morning, and we want to see additional investments by our European allies in the capabilities that we've agreed collectively, not just in the context of 2 and 20, but we've agreed collectively are required uh, to meet the security threats that we all agree we face. I mean, these are shared NATO strategic assessments. They're not American, they're not Norwegian, they're, they're shared among the allies. Um, and as the Secretary General has pointed out, we've made a lot of progress. Now, I will concede uh, that it's taken a little bit of forceful advocation on the part of the United States to move past, uh, I think, where we were when Robert Gates made his famous speech, where we didn't, quite frankly, see a reaction among many of our European allies to what he was essentially asking. But I do think we've made progress, and I think that's positive. If you look at what happened at the NATO summit in Brussels, the, you know, this is very NATO wonky, and forgive me for being a bit of a NATO geek, but, you know, command structure adaptation, military mobility, speed of decision making, hybrid, cyber, uh, the standing up the new commands, those are all important. And it's, they're important, concrete, physical manifestations of the kind of cooperation and progress I'm talking about. On China and 5G, again, I see far more commonality uh, to start with, we all recognize we've got a problem. Uh, and we're all beginning to deal with it. And we've made more progress in the last several months in terms of, uh, you know, public analyses by, you know, intelligence and security agencies across the continent here in Europe saying we got a challenge. Decisions not to make the kinds of investments that they worry will be compromising to their own national security and to the transatlantic space. That's positive. Uh, even on Iran, um, you know, uh, shared understanding of the challenge of Iranian regional uh, meddling, of the, the, you know, the broader terrorist threat, some of the sanctions that have been put in place by the Europeans and the United States, that's real, and that's important. Yes, we have a JCPOA issue where we have difference of views uh, about the effectiveness of that uh, agreement and where we go from here. But uh, that's a portion of the relationship, not the only part of it. Um, you know, we uh, have started a, a conversation with the union on trade issues. It's not easy, I mean, because these are infinitely, these are connected to domestic politics on both sides of the Atlantic, so they're hard. But that conversation's begun, and I think that's a positive. So, you know, I, I'm not pangloss here. Uh, I don't think all is necessarily automatically well in the world. I think we are actors on this stage, and we have agency, and if we if we exercise that agency to address shared strategic challenges, we can meet them because the U.S. and Europe together are incredibly powerful economically, diplomatically, and militarily and have the capacity to shape 
of the global order in a way that, that promotes prosperity, security, and freedom, not just for ourselves, but for other members of the global community. We've done it in the past. Now, my message is also, just because we've done it doesn't mean we can just drift into another set of successes. Uh, it does take uh, making the difficult decisions and, and seeing the world as it is and making the difficult decisions required to meet those challenges. So I think that's all part of it as well. Um, you know, I'm under no illusions that it's easy. I mean, I suppose I wouldn't be a committed transatlanticist if I weren't an optimist here. So you have to forgive my optimism. Uh, I think it's an easier way to go through life as a diplomat than being a pessimist all the time. No, it's uh, great. I, lo I like optimism. Uh, added with I'm, some I'm more pessimistic well. when I'm sitting around the dinner table with my wife having a glass of wine, I suppose. <laughs> Complaining about the day's work. <laughs> okay, gosh, thank, yeah. thank you. I, I, I take the floor again. I, I, you talked a lot about cyber um, security in your talk, and, and I'd like to follow up on that a little bit, if I may. Uh, it is, as, as we become more digitalized, uh, there's new vulnerabilities coming up, and, and you see a lot of espionage and even some attempts at sabotage through these means. Uh, but as a diplomat, uh, you know, this is kind of anarchical space, right? Uh, there are no regulation. But as a diplomat, you see any prospect, any, any could diplomacy play any role in, in mitigating these, these, these threats we see through the digital world? Well, I think it has already in, the terms of, in terms of what we do to work together to develop shared strategies for dealing with the challenge. Uh, we do a lot of technical work with our allies, sharing our expertise, uh, learning from them. I mean, there are allies uh, to the east of, of you uh, that have a deep understanding of the hybrid challenges, deeper understanding than we have of the hybrid challenges in the United States. I mean, I think 2016 was a real shock to Americans, um, but it's something that the Finns understand uh, or the Lithuanians understand much better, and we learn from them. Uh, the Centers for Excellence that the Alliance has established uh, and the European Center for Excellence that uh, exists in Helsinki on countering hybrid threats, for example, are all areas where we work together. Uh, lessons learned, exchange of information, joint training, uh, exercises. We just had an, uh, the annual CMX exercise inside the Alliance which posited uh, some cyber uh, activity. There can be more cooperation between the NATO and you in this area. So there's a lot going on. I think it gets very wonky and very weedy pretty quickly, and I think it's all part of the diplomatic engagement that you see, th that you don't see happening, that does happen every day across the Atlantic. Also, too much Russia and China. We, uh, look, we have conversations with the Russians and the Chinese about their behavior as well. Uh, you know, I don't, we, we've also had to sanction them to signal to them that we are unhappy with it. I mean, I think the challenge with Russia, uh, going back to what I was saying earlier, is persuading it to stop doing the kind of things we've seen it doing, whether it's cyber attacks, hybrid activities, energy manipulation, you know, the conventional threats, you know, the invasions of its neighbors, the attempts to reestablish spheres of influence. We have to persuade Russia that the risks associated with doing that kind of behavior, uh, you know, outweigh the benefits. And we're not there yet. Uh, you know, we're playing, you know, I think historians will argue, and I'm not an historian, but historians will argue that these global patterns that really sort of hit us in the face in 2014 began much earlier and you know all of us were probably a bit slow to respond to that um, so we still have some work to do to catch up and persuade our adversaries that we're serious about meeting the challenges they present. Uh, Michael, can you have two more questions for me and uh, sure. if you have, and so the first one relates to what you said about geopolitics and, and uh, geoeconomics and, and you said uh, uh, yeah. You have this uh, kind of holiday, f holiday from history. Uh, so, um, s now, f if you're engaged in geopolitics and use geoeconomic or economic instruments, uh, economic statecraft, it's very different if you're in a small state or if you're a big, massive uh, economy like the U.S. And what, what we have seen during the last few years is an increased willingness, I would say, in the U.S. to use economic tools to achieve also security policy goals. Uh, we see increased use of sanctions, um, willingness to have uh, extra terrestrial kind of jurisdiction etc. So use economic instruments, use market rules in order to achieve uh, goals. Uh, but at the same time we see some kind of counter reactions to this. 
uh, uh, increased willingness to find other currencies or to maybe move out of kind of this American control system. So, so uh, could you kind of share some insights of what's going on in, and also among academics, there's a discussion about kind of is there a risk of overstretching, overplaying some of the economic tools and instruments? Uh, could it backfire, etc.? So, so, where do you see this discussion going in the U.S.? Is there, is there now concern that we are kind of overplaying our hand, or uh, are we kind of, uh, or do you feel that you have a right balance somehow? Well, I think there will always you be. See, you see yeah, I, mean, I understand the question. I think there's always a debate uh, among experts about the right balance in any policy. Um, and I think at any given moment in time, you're going to have people arguing both sides of that question. Um, I think it looks, uh, it's a little bit more heated and looks more complicated because th we are going through, I think we really are going through a strategic pivot in the world. We're all getting used to operating mentally, uh, and this is important, mentally in a world uh, that we haven't had to operate in a long time. So some of these questions are actually not new, they're old. Uh, and it's useful to go back and sort of relearn from our own past about how we dealt with similar sets of challenges. So, you know, I, you know, I think that we're perfectly capable in the United States and in Europe of making adjustments to policy when we feel we need to make them. Um, you know, I think we've been smart in how we've responded uh, in, in since, you know, 2014, but particularly in the last few years to the Russia challenge. Uh, in terms of what we're doing in the alliance and what we're doing in terms of modernization of our forces in the U.S. and in Europe. I think we have a lot more to do. I don't want to undercut the message I was delivering. We have a lot of work, but I think we've been smart. And I think we've been smart uh, in waking up to the challenges posed by China globally and to begin to put in place processes in our respective countries and institutions to address those challenges. Um, you know, we can't um, you know, one of the arguments you get sometimes when you talk about how do you, how do you respond to, to Russian aggression is often, well, if we respond to Russian aggression, Russia will be aggressive. And, you know, that doesn't solve you. That's not the answer. You have to be prepared to deal with the challenge as it exists, which is, you know, a theme of what I've been saying uh, all morning. And, you know, you can't use the, you know, well, Russia may invade Ukraine in the next Crimea if we put a sanction on it. Well, they've done that. Um, that's the reason we need to respond. Uh, and if we don't, uh, this is just fundamental, I think, international relations theory, the Russians will continue to do what they're doing, for example. No, I'm in okay, we have two more minutes. Okay, so then uh, since you're in this business of providing a bit of insurance and uh, confidence, a bit of an optimistic perspective, let me tr just end with uh, uh, a, a question related to the multilateral or of the multilateral system somehow. <coughs> I think in just some few weeks, the Norwegian government, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, will present a kind of white paper on, on, on the importance for Norway to continue to promote the multilateral system, international legal system, etc. And, and uh, I, this is uh, f fairly fundamental to Norwegian foreign policy and, and to small states in general. So. Um, so how do you see the U.S. basically in this? And the U.S. has been, of course, very instrumental in building this system and funding it and supporting it and, and exercising its leadership through the, the multilateral system. Uh, but at the same time, there's increased concern about the U.S. commitment to this. Uh, we read Pompeo's speech in, uh, in, in Brussels this fall. Uh, so how, how do you view the U.S. role in this multilateral system, more general? I, I don't think, I mean, I think a lot of people have read Secretary Pompeo's speech from Brussels. I think a lot of people have misread Secretary Pompeo's speech from Brussels. I think, you know, he was trying to signal not that we don't believe in the multilateral system. We do. But that the system isn't the purpose. Uh, you know, that the system has uh, elements to it that aren't working the way they were intended or aren't reflective of the world in which we live in today. And we need to be able to adapt that system to the new realities. Um, uh, you know, if you, you, you I don't want to, you don't want to consume, consume, confuse process and outcomes here. I mean, you want to use the multilateral system to produce outcomes that enhance prosperity, freedom, security, that's 
the in our individual national interest. That's the purpose of it. Um, if it's not doing that, if it's just merely meeting to meet, then something's wrong. Um, and I think that's one of the challenges uh, we all face. Um, so, you know, I I think that's what Secretary Pompeo was was saying, and I you know he has made clear that uh, in other speeches this the, the same thing. Um, and I think the United States will continue to, to, you know, play in the system and support the system uh, where it can, but where there's a need of strategic renovation, I think we're going to talk about it. Excellent. Okay. Thank you so much. Please uh, uh, join me in thanking uh, uh, Mark Murphy for uh, his uh, kind of commitment and willingness to take questions, excellent speech, and, and uh, to, uh, thank you to all of you as well for joining in uh, this morning for a very interesting exercise and uh, discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you. It was a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Great.